Hi folks, um, my name is Mariana, or just Mari. Uh, I'm a Python developer uh, who keeps getting into front-end development. Uh, I've been part of the Python community in Brazil for many years now, uh, and I'm in this personal project of conquering the North part Pythonist world. So that's my third DjangoCon. I'm super happy to be here. Uh, and I'll be presenting this talk with my colleague, Dani. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Dani, and I'm a UX designer, Crazy Cat Lady. And it's my first time presenting in a conference, and actually my first time attending a depth-focused conference. So I'm really grateful to be here to spread the design word for everyone. And we know how hard it is to put a conference like this together. So we would like to, to thank the organization team for making that possible. And a disclaimer for pandemic time, we've been quarantined together. So this is desolation for us. This is our office and it's empty. So yeah. <laughs> we both work at LabCodes and we are an outsourcing software studio that builds great custom products and we build them, so they're really great. And we are based in Recipe, an always sunny city in Brazilian Northeast, as you can see. And it is so great that Mari moved from the famous Rio de Janeiro to here. <laughs> it is great. Uh, so uh, let's talk about uh, this talk today. Uh, We'll give you a brief description of what a design system is and its base concepts. Uh, we will discuss uh, what it means uh, for a developer to work with a design system, how it can improve our work. Then uh, we'll get you, we'll present to you uh, a project we work together uh, where we had the, the chance to implement some of those concepts. And then we'll, um, explain to you how this process worked for us, what worked, what didn't, and the process uh, we developed in the end, uh, applying those concepts. So let's start. Why having a design system at all? What is good about it? And I personally, the, there are a lot of definitions around, but I personally like the Envision's definition of it as a collection of reusable components guided by clear standards that can be assembled together to build any number of applications. And even though it's a team, team's responsibility to make an interface consistent between pages and interactions, designers, we often take it fully. And don't look away because I know a developer does it and it's not really your fault. And, but using these building blocks, can make it really easier to distribute this responsibility by creating a source of truth where everyone has a voice, improving the communication between developers and designers and making deliveries faster, since some specs can actually be skipped and even some layouts can be skipped, but I've never said that to you, okay? And last but not least, once it's done, it makes time to focus on what really matters and that's the other person on the side on the other side of uh, our software and that builds an experience rather than a screen and the result uh, of all of that is an application with a more professional looking custom to the brand standards and you may ask why not just using a bootstrap instead and the answer is you actually can. We, for example, use Bulma within the lab codes design system. But if you have used those frameworks in a product that has some years, you may understand that with time, it will no longer accomplish things easy breezy, copy and paste, paste that we are used to. And you will most likely start to create components free of the frameworks uh, constraints to match the products um, needs without a clear standard to follow. There are no guides to follow and, well, it can become a mess. <laughs> and so a design system goes way beyond a component library like those frameworks. It creates a language based on the team's culture. 
And instead of generic words and nesting patterns, they are really hard to replicate actually, designers, developers, and even stakeholders will be able to understand uh, more easily when things are not matching the expected behaviors and styles because it was built by all of them. And that's distributing the, uh, that responsibility that I was talking about. Um, but no more design talking. So what do we have to do with that? Uh, as developers, we love patterns. We love uh, predictability. That's uh, our work to build these patterns. So thanks to the design system, we can implement consistent UIs much easier. Uh, when we look at a particular page, having a design system behind it, we can think of it as a combination of known components and principles. When I look at a button, for example, I don't have to think about it as a button with uh, some uh, hash back color, uh, background color, 14 pixels bold font and 8 pixels padding. Uh, I just know that it's a primary button that I've built it somewhere else. Uh, and I just have to re reuse that thing. Uh, so the main points of having a design system is that it's a source of truth. So whenever I have a doubt about it, I just have to look at my design system. Uh, it, it, it creates a common vocabulary for us. Uh, we can use the design system as a basis for our project's file structure. Uh, and it makes it more, uh, much more easy to QA our own work before we submit that. Uh, so, talking about vocabulary, uh, it's often when we implement a layout that we have some doubts about uh, implementation details, we face problems uh, with the code and we have to communicate that. And when that happens, uh, it's much easier to have a common vocabulary to talk about uh, the page elements, both with the designer and uh, stakeholders like product managers or our clients. Uh, if we have to uh, ask something about a component or inform that we have a problem with it, uh, we can make sure that everyone knows what we, we're talking about. Uh, besides, des designers have already talked about uh, the meaning of the components. Uh, so uh, they know uh, what it means to the final user and for our stakeholders uh, to have that component. So when I, as a developer, when I look at a component in the design system, I only recognize the visual elements. Uh, but uh, she already uh, developed it uh, thinking about the meaning. So I will use this meaning to name my components instead of uh, just the visual elements. Uh, and, and the structure uh, they use to organize the elements, the small uh, and big elements of the design system, things like the color, uh, theme, uh, typography, or uh, big layouts, this structure will be reflect on my uh, code organization. So as you can see, I can uh, divide my, my style sheets uh, according to the pro uh, these definitions that I already became from the design system. Uh, and I can easily QA uh, my own work before I submit it. So when I look at a component, I already recognize this known uh, patterns and elements that I have to work with. Uh, and when I check my own work, I just have to check for those elements that I already know instead of uh, looking into each part in, term, in terms of numbers. I can, for example, uh, say that this, this is a large or small font size. This is a small, a medium, or large spacing. Uh, so checking everything before submitting is much easier 
when I have all of that. So, but let's talk about real life, right? Uh, we had a project to work on uh, that was a redesign of a platform uh, with a lot of legacy code and clear business rules, uh, messy, really messy code. Uh, and as we did as like everyone does, we started simple. So <laughs> <laughs> we had a team of two sites and it was lab codes. Um, side and the client side, and we had an internal project manager um, be, uh, besides us, ourselves, and I was the designer, and Mari was the developer, and from the client side, we had another developer and a, the product owner. So we gathered everything we wanted and tossed it into a Trello board, which we reviewed weekly with both teams and reviewed tasks separately. Uh, the product was already established and had all sorts of styles, but no guidelines at all. So after understanding the audience and team's desires, our first proposal was to create a design system to make the product more consistent. And, but the design system takes time, really, and we didn't have that. So we started with a UI library like that with um, the color scheme, some icons, some form components and started from there. But that didn't quite work, actually. <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, we had, we faced some problems with that. So we couldn't track the history of, uh, of a task between development and design, actually between design and development. Uh, we we developers didn't uh, revise, review uh, the designs before implementing that. So uh, implementation uh, challenges uh, could be unnoticed. Uh, sometimes we, we lack the data we needed to build that. And tasks would constantly come back from QA uh, with both problems that it's normal to face but also with new requests from the client. Uh, so we had a hard time separating was what was actually a, a problem from what was a new request. And what about the design system, you may ask? Wasn't it supposed to solve exactly that? And the answer is yes. And we had started at this point, as I've mentioned, but one thing was missing though. It, it, for a design system to be a system, actually, it should make it easier for designers and developers to make autonomous decisions. And that was not really the case. In other words, um, we should be able to link uh, the what, the assets, uh, to the why, the decisions, and, and the how, and that's the specs. And we would do all of that in rituals, and we started implementing that. Uh, with time, but more than a robust UI library or a guideline, a design system is a process, and that's the game changer in real life projects, actually. So, how did that process work? Uh, we migrated uh, from Trello to Jira, uh, not we, because we particularly liked the, the technology, but it had the resources we needed, and well, that's that slide you're looking at right now <laughs> seems a bit crazy, <laughs> but that's our Jira workflow. Uh, it's not that complicated uh, when you understand it. Uh, we had a planning board where we would uh, get our next ideas. So anything the client wanted to, to implement, a new page or a refactoring of a, of a page, uh, this task would go to discovery where uh, designers and, and the client would talk about what they wanted, the user needs, uh, the goal to achieve with that. Uh, designers would do their, uh, their research, uh, come up with uh, ideas and would, they would define uh, what actually needed to be done in this, uh, in this 
uh, task. So then after the discovery process, uh, a task would go to the design board where, well, design magic happens. <laughs> Um, so just to recap a bit, because I know it's a bit overwhelming, but we had an idea and we put that in our backlog and then we moved that to discovery where we could all get together or just a product owner or product owner and designers and get together to make that idea a bit more um, thought, I think. And it would be like a, a better description of the idea. And then it would go to spec, to design, sorry, and then to spec, and then it would go to, to development. But let's focus just for a bit uh, in design. So to make it simple, we research, we prototype, and we validate. And all phases may include other teammates, and in validation, ideally, <laughs> we would include real users, but it doesn't really happen for every task. It will depend on what sort of data and purpose we have for each feature. Uh, once approved from design, tests get back to the planning board and for specifying. And only after defining what needs to be implemented, the task is ready to death. Sometimes it needs to go back for more design iteration or to be um, more detailed, like missing states or something like that. Uh, and that's what happens in the spec meeting. We check for all of that. So uh, that's a ritual we introduced uh, after facing uh, problems uh, in implementing some designs. So that's where we would sit together, designers uh, and developers, uh, to <laughs> uh, to check if it's actually uh, possible to build the design we have. So we check for available data uh, from the back end for uh, an API uh, endpoint, for example. Uh, we check for components that are we already built before or uh, see if we have to build new ones. Uh, we see if the interactions are viable. For example, a super complex animation may not fit in the time we have to, to develop that. Uh, we measure the efforts to, to actually implement everything and we build, uh, we break the, the big tasks into smaller deliverables. Uh, so then comes the development boards, that one, uh, I believe you all know how it works. We start with tasks in the, our to-do list. Uh, they go in progress. Uh, they have, they are code reviewed. They are QA'd by, uh, by designers and uh, stakeholders. Uh, and ideally they would go directly to uh, production, but that QA uh, step is always uh, the messy one. The thing was just a checklist to improve the QA cycle. And it was very simple, yet varies from task to task. Mostly, it will describe the task purpose and implemented behaviors against the design specs provided. It seems very simple and unnecessary since we already had this information previously. Um, but it made simple um, and easier to distinguish uh, requirements from suggestions and to keep tests moving forward and not going back and forth. Um, it also made the communication with stakeholders way easier and they knew right away what they had to do and finally understood that if you want something else from the test purpose, you should add it to another task instead of going back and forth with the same one. But what really, really, really work for us, and I believe that for everyone else, is communication. Communication is for sure the most valuable tool in, in all teams. Uh, but we have to enable it to happen. 
the tools we use make it possible and we as individuals should make it possible as well and that is to include the whole thing from the beginning to the end even on the design phases and as tools we use figma for design in handoff jira for management and git for development but any tool will do it and this way everyone can have perspective and understand the delays and struggles to come up with better strategy and for the project and our process makes it easier to gather constant feedback in all phases and keep non-technical people informed of the limit limitations and delays we face along the way. Since we review each other's work in several steps and rituals, uh, it's really uh, easy to spot differences. And for me, this is the most important uh, thing. And it goes directly, it connects direct, directly to the spec meeting. So we couldn't achieve a robust design system for this project specifically because it was a short project and it ended, um, but it was our first opportunity to test this, uh, this process and design system methodology. So it was then improved to, bu to build our own design system and it guides our internal projects and can also be used as a framework to our clients. So now it's a bit easier to um, develop a design system for our clients too. And even though it is still a baby system, it's already helped us a lot to improve our process. And we've been writing some content with our lessons to help everyone who's struggling to build their own from zero. Um, so thank you guys very much. Um, this is us presenting uh, in our IRL silks and we are a great team. Uh, together and outside work, this work actually. <laughs> uh, thank you very much. We hope you, our experience helps you to grow your own things and make lasting bonds between designers and developers. And if you want to get updates, um, please uh, use this link, the Letcodes Junk Call 2020 to uh, sign up for our newsletter. It's um, bi-weekly, I guess. Yep. And the next edition will contain this presentation too. And other than what we write, we also share insightful texts and articles from all around that inspire our work. Um, we hope we keep in touch and we'd love to hear from you. Yeah. So thank you very much for, for listening to us. Uh, and now in the Q&A session, uh, we can... Uh, Answer. Answer any <laughs> doubts you have or uh, talk more specifically uh, to points you may find uh, interesting yourselves. So uh, we are up to that. Uh, thank you very much. Bye bye. Bye. Uh, so uh, someone asked, uh, did uh, you use Wagtail, Django, CMS, others, or the or custom sh solution? Why? Uh, no, uh, we, uh, this project uh, already existed, was like a Django, the Django template and a REST API and AngularJS on the front end. Uh, so yeah, we basically had to adapt to the situation we had. So, yeah, like was the the CSS was uh, especially a mess. So we had to like try to not override too much styles, uh, so not to affect other pages that already existed. Then, yeah, basically everything was implemented by hand. But with the this design system uh, that we're implementing now. We're using a storybook, React storybook. So we're building the components directly in React. Uh, yeah, so, and like the goal is that we can, you can install the design system as a separate NPM project. Uh, so basically uh, in the future when we have it ready, uh, 
and we, we want to start a new project with uh, this system. Uh, basically, we would include uh, the NPM dependency, uh, like the, the NPM project as a dependency uh, on the project, and we have all the components available there. Uh, anyone else? React, uh, React Storybook, uh, you said. Uh, yeah. Okay, but, uh, in Django, for the persistence of the data, who, what uh, would uh, you use uh, uh, if you have to choose one? A custom solution, so, yes? Yeah, like, uh, if I were to build, uh, like, a CMS thing, uh, where I have, uh, yeah, for example, this... Uh, a design system uh, in a CMS will probably uh, use like one of the uh, solutions that are already exist in the marketing. But I don't. I'm not sure if I understood the like data persistency. So the data entry is uh, done uh, in the admin, I think. You are using a uh, Django, yes? For yeah, the... yeah, it was a, a common Django project, just like straight, straight Django. And so, uh, to use an input uh, in uh, in uh, in in your template, uh, a button or uh, something uh, other, you have to build a component. Okay, so that component uh, is uh, an object in uh, your database no uh, no no it's it's just html and css uh i we build the css that says uh, like the oh, okay it's a, a, it's a static, a it's static component yeah yeah it's just static oh, okay. Components. okay okay yeah but i mean uh both things like if, if you can build a design system just in in your css and html uh, you just have to like build your classes and and use them consistently or in this case in this like new um system we're developing uh it's like there are react components as we're building that in in react so you would uh, import a component in your layout and and just use it but you, you could like also use the css separately for example if you wanted to install the the system but you don't want to use it with react the css will be there anyway so you could just like create your html and use the appropriate uh, css classes okay thank you nothing um Anyone else? So uh, while uh, someone comes to with a new question, I just wanted to point out, uh, like dialoguing with the previous talk, um, one of the learnings from, from this is how accessibility is uh, also our job as as developers so it's not only the designer that has to implement uh, all the hover and focus states and say like describe uh, all the accessibility uh, things in the in the project it's our job also as developers to be aware of that uh, so in this new project i'm i'm working on right now i'm like the alt text policy <laughs> police i'm always complaining well where's the the tech, the description for that image i didn't get that or some if if i eventually notice that a component doesn't have uh the focus state i can like call out to the designer and say hey hey you forgot this to add that state like so please add it and it like makes a huge difference if i don't have to be a designer to have that uh sensibility and to uh yeah be concerned with that uh, 
Yeah, just to complement what Mary was saying, uh, our design system is already coming with the components that goes together with our whole accessibility section. Um, just like the IBM one or something like that, if you're familiar with. And some things are really hard to, to find how to implement, especially regarding complex elements like uh, a list view or something like that with multiple columns. And it's very useful to, to see new, new tools and uh, guidelines uh, that sum up the, the web and um, uh, guidelines. So, <laughs> well, if you have any anything to to add, it would be very very useful for us too. Thank you. I think next talk, talk is starting soon. No, not yet. I have another uh, question. Yeah. Um, how do you handle uh, translations? They are static too. Yes. Yeah. In this in this case, we didn't uh, handle translations because the product was only for uh, the US, so they only needed English. Although, of course, not anyone in in the US uh, speaks English, but uh, that wasn't like a requirement for for the project um but yeah like i think uh you know regular django uh, we would a project we would just use django translation tools like that when you like use that uh Rosetta. uh yeah like that uh how, what's how is it called again uh that you get text lazy Yes, Where yes. You, yeah, so. Okay, clear. But yeah, we never dealt, for example, with things like uh, right to left um, layouts uh, that should be really, really hard to to implement. Uh, so I have no idea how we would do that. We would probably have to learn it on the fly because, yeah. Okay, okay. Thank you. No Well, if no one has another question, just wanted to say something else I remembered. Uh, <laughs> yeah, like one of the the best things about uh, having those this predictable collection of things is that uh, we as developers get to train our brains to um, work in that uh, pattern. So like I'm not a designer, uh, I, I may have a, a static uh, 
sensibility to say, well, that doesn't look very good. So that could look better. But I, I'm not a designer, so I don't know the principles behind like the the layouts uh, that I'm I'm implementing. But when I have uh, really consistent elements to work with, uh, my brain just uh, starts identifying those those things automatically. Uh, so, for example, I know that normally. Uh, uh, a heading and a subheading will have a small uh, spacing between between it, uh, and I've seen this pattern so many times that if I just forget to put that spacing between my my title and subtitle, uh, I will notice that right away uh, because like it's just uh, photographed in my mind that like this is important and especially with spacings because there's like any layout has always lots of lots of spaces um, that's <laughs> the thing you most do in css is like add space there 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 uh, and when i have a very limited collection of options so i either have four pixel eight uh, 16 32 64 pixel spacing options uh, my brain just learned to immediately recognize them uh, in a in a layout, so I don't have to be like inspecting each one of the spaces between each one of the elements like the whole time, because like they're just internalized. Uh, so when I look at the design, I just they automatically just pop uh, into my eyes. Uh, so like it makes the work much, much, much faster, uh, like having that exercise in our minds. So, yeah. Yeah, actually it's like we design it too. I mean, with time you get familiar with the, with the systems. I mean, the small systems that you have in the whole system. So yeah, it's just a thing of getting used to it. Hey. So, hey, <laughs> Mari, follow-up question to that last comment. So how do you handle um, updates to those common components? Um, yeah, like, uh, I don't think we had a, a situation where like a, com uh, a component was updated in the design system, so it would be updated for the whole project. Um, but yeah, I think that's actually the best uh, case when it should happen. So uh, like if you decide that that button now has to look different everywhere, uh, you just would uh, update the main component. Other than that, we would, I think, just create a variant of the component uh, and say like, we just want this uh, changed value uh, in that specific place. So we would create a, a another variant of the, the component. But maybe Danny can say more about that. Yeah, uh, the, the project is structured in a way that you have the design system and other projects consume that design system. So you can pick what you will be uh, updating or not with your subsystem, sub project or something like that. Yeah. So can I follow up for a second with just like a clarification? Um, so I guess maybe specifically, how do you communicate with like the design team and also the the project owners to sort of be like, okay, well, if we change this button, it's gonna change uh, everywhere, right? Um, mm -hmm. Like how do you like manage that sort of communication or feedback or, um, we don't have this uh, huge uh, uh, structure for this hierarchy like that in our company. So uh, we don't have many products, internal products. So it doesn't really happen for us because we are a small team and everyone is always communicating. Um, but for clients, for example, uh, it would be like when you get a system update, you get a notification and you can pick which ones uh, you are going to update really. 
so it would work sort of like that i don't know if clarifies for you but yeah yeah i think mostly like as a you know developer team uh we would say well we we do have really have to update this this thing uh, and we would ask the design team so yeah are you okay updating that to the whole platform or uh, do you prefer that we customize this one and leave the rest as it is or something i think we would just ask for their opinion and yeah yeah, I mean, not, not all components would be like directly to the design system. Some components are um, specific for a specific case on a project. And we call that snowflakes. Um, they exist outside the, the design system, but follow those rules too. Um, so some specific cases would be like more custom to the project. Mm 